really, this is a, a wonderful day for me. This is a tremendous homecoming uh, because um, I don't think Stephen even knew it when he invited me to this event. But I grew up in Othello, um, although I've lived in Washington, D.C. for a long time. But uh, I grew up uh, you know, just north of the Tri-Cities and south of Moses Lake, about 100 miles west of here. And uh, in, in fact, the last time that I was in this area was I came to basketball camp at uh, Washington State University in 1968 when I was uh, in the eighth grade. I came to basketball camp for two weeks. And that basketball camp made me realize that I probably wasn't going to be a point guard for the Seattle Supersonics. That was my goal at that point, and that I might think of other career objectives. So uh, I figured I'd, I'd better start looking for something else. That was the first time I saw really good basketball players coming from Othello. So Othello, you know, I, I grew up in a fairly religious family and in a fairly religious part of the country in a fairly religious town. Um, but, you know, we were Presbyterians. We were talking at dinner, and, and Presbyterians weren't quite so dogmatic in telling people uh, sort of how they should think about the world. And the other thing was that 1968 was really a time of science. Uh, the Apollo program was going on, so men were about to land on the moon, and um, uh, that was... Uh, and you know, these, these fancy things called computers were getting a lot more attention. And, and Hanford itself, um, you know, we used to describe Othello as being just downwind from the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, uh, and still is, of course. But um, you know, people there were, were proud of the role that Hanford had played in, uh, in winning World War II. And if I, once I get this book about Mount St. Helens is done, I'd really love to write a book about Hanford because uh, the, the history there is just so rich and, and interesting, I think. Uh, so I went off to college, uh, sort of thinking that I would study science, and, um, but then I, I got sidetracked by an English class in, um, when I was a freshman and started reading books that I'd never read in Othello before. And these, these books were, um, you know, really, really changed my mind about things to do now that I'd given up basketball as a, as a career possibility. And, um, but I did graduate with a physics degree, and I went to work as a science writer in Washington, D.C. So when I got to Washington, D.C., which was 1978, uh, is, is when I started working as a science writer there. I majored in physics because physics was such a cool field that had you know, relativity and black holes and quantum mechanics and all these neat things. But at the time that I got uh, to Washington, D.C., it was pretty clear that the life sciences were really going to be where the, where the interesting action was in science uh, in, in decades after that. So I started taking classes at the National Institutes of Health, which is uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, right outside Washington, D.C. And so I started writing about uh, the life sciences and about genetics, and sort of one thing led to another, and I've been writing about evolution pretty much since that time. And you know what I discovered is that, wow, the life sciences were just as cool as physics. Um, in many ways, um, in many ways, even cooler. Uh, you know, so you, you can't see it in this graphic, but um, there's sort of a map of the world in this big black thing right here. But if you imagine that that big black thing is the size of a period, so a, a period on a printed page, which is about a half millimeter apart, then that little white oval is the size of a human cell that would that would sit on a period. And DNA, you know, the DNA molecule in there is much much tinier than that. But you know, it's just incredible that that molecule uh, has the you know, instructions of how to build a human being, or um, in other cases, how to build any kind of organism, you know, from this from this extremely tiny little molecule. You know, we don't know how to really read the instructions, uh, those instructions yet. But, I, but but biologists will figure it out. I figure over the next hundred years, in the same way that we've made so much progress in physics over the past hundred years. But you know, DNA molecules that are in those human cells have something else. We all got our DNA molecules from our parents, and they got them from their parents, and so on back through all of, all of humans into our non-human ancestors. So really what they contain is this record of who had children with whom over the whole course of human history. And as people started looking at DNA, they realized that they could, they could read that record, that it had you know, just this incredible story of um, human migrations and human population expansions and the interactions of different groups with each other and, and what, what we mean about biologically when we're talking about something like race and ethnicity. So that was the reason that I wrote this book right here called Mapping Human History, uh, Genes, Race, and Our Common Origins. This book is getting a little bit older right now, but luckily most of the, most of the information that's in this book is still relevant. You know, when this book was coming out, what I really wanted to call it was The Story of Us. Um, but there was this, uh, there was this terrible uh, Bruce Willis movie that came out called The Story of Us at about that same time. My editor says, oh no, you can't call it that. 
because people will just think of this terrible Bruce Willis movie. But that's really kind of the, the story that's written in DNA, is, um, is the story of human beings, uh, uh, where we came from, and, and biologically, uh, how we're related to each other, and, and what the history of our species has been. So there are going to be, uh, I'm going to talk about the past in two ways today. Um, th there are two different ways you can think about it, and I'm going to go over both of them today. Uh, one way is to start from the past, say from about 200,000 years ago, and work your way up to the present. And we're going to talk mostly about genetics when we're talking about that approach. Uh, but the other way you can do it is you can start from the present and work your way back into the past. And when you do that, you use family trees and, and genealogy. So uh, I'm going to do, do the genetics part first, and then I'm going to do the genealogical part. And what's interesting is that even though there's two different ways of looking at the human past, they both sort of have the same, the same underlying message. So William Faulkner once wrote, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. And you, know, you can really see that when you just look around at human beings. Uh, you know, we have many different physical appearances. We have different skin colors, uh, different body shapes, different features. And, and these things, you know, the differences, the physical differences in human beings are at least partly a product of our past and of our biological heritage. It's, it's, it's actually the case that human beings have more physical differences, or there, there are more physically varied species than any other mammalian species, with the exception of, of livestock that we breed on purpose, partly for different appearances, but partly for other characteristics as well. So, if, so I mean, given the wide range of appearances of human beings, you'd think that if you looked at the DNA of human beings, that it would be similarly different from each other, that human beings would be would be quite distant, for instance, that one human group would be distant genetically from another human group. But you know what you find is the exact opposite. You find that human beings are surprisingly similar when you look at the genetic variation from those groups. So here's a little way. So you know, uh, you can take the chimpanzees. If you, if you t just look at the genetics of the chimpanzees that live on a hillside in Africa, they have twice, two chimps will have twice as much genetic difference, that's sort of the, the width of that black bar right there, as, as any two humans anywhere in the world. I mean, ch the chimpanzees on a single hillside have far more genetic differences than do all of the seven billion people that live on the planet Earth. Uh, there's another way, geneticists know some of these diagrams. This is another way of looking at the genetic differences between individuals. This is called a genetic distance diagram. And um, oh, you can sort of think of individuals, individual humans, individual chimps, individual gorillas as being at the ends of those line segments right there. And the lengths of the line segments show the, the genetic differences between just representative individuals. So you can see that chimpanzees and bonobos and grunellas are, are much more different from each other than our humans. That's, that's all seven billion humans down there clustered in that, in that little tiny uh, thing down there. Something else that really surprised geneticists when they, when they started looking at human differences was that, um, uh, you know, all, all humans have the same genes, but we sort of have different varieties of our genes. So one question you can ask is, how much of the genetic differences between humans is found within a human group, like Africans or Europeans, and how many genetic differences do, do those groups share? So again, it surprised geneticists when they looked at the groups and they found that most of the variation in genes in humans are shared among all human groups. Um, there's relatively little genetic differences between human groups. So you see humans down there, um, I don't have a, a clicker, where are they? Yeah, see they're way down at the bottom here. It, it turns out that only about 15% of the genetic differences in humans uh, distinguish one group from another. And again, that's quite different than other species. In other species of animals, like the gray wolves there, or um, uh, elephants as well, uh, the different groups of within a species are far more different genetically than is the case for human beings. So uh, conservation biologists have this sort of general rule of thumb that uh, the genetic differences between groups have to be greater than 20, 25, 30 percent to divide a group into subspecies, or what Charles Darwin would have called races. I mean, that was uh, that was a term that was uh, being used in the 19th century. So if you use that standard, by that rule of thumb, human races really don't exist. The group differences between humans just aren't great enough. Oh, there is. Oh, good, because I'm going to need it later on. Oh, here it is. 
Excellent. So, there's, so here's humans down here at 15%. This is the, the, the genetic amount of differences between groups. And again, here are elephants. They're at about 40%. Gray wolves in the northern hemisphere, you know, huge group differences between organisms that biologists can probably distinguish. But so, so human beings are a mixed up species because we have these very different physical appearances, but at the same time are very, are very similar genetically compared to other organisms. So geneticists ask why this is, and you know, there's really only one explanation for how humans could be so similar genetically. We must all be descended from a relatively small group of people who lived in the relatively recent past. That's really the only conclusion you can draw from the genetic differences between humans. So of course, then you have to go to the archeological record to figure out where this group might have lived. And you know, the answer is, is actually fairly obvious. Uh, in the fossil record of the human fossil record, about 150 or 200,000 years ago, you find a, uh, the first appearance in the fossil record of anatomically modern humans, uh, humans that, that look like us. And they have sort of these high foreheads like this. Uh, they, have a, they have a chin, uh, relatively light and graceful bodies. So you see the appearance of a group with these uh, in, in the fossil record of, of this group about 150,000 years ago. Um, and then this group starts to move out of Africa. Oh, by the way, uh, that's, that's where you find these fossils, is in Eastern Africa, sort of the region of uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, right around there is where, the, where you first see uh, humans, anatomically modern humans in the fossil record. So then you can start tracing in both the fossil record and in the genetic record the movement of modern humans out into the rest of the world. You see modern humans there at about 100,000 years ago. Uh, probably the first permanent movement of modern humans out of Africa was into the Middle East about 60,000 years ago. Very quickly, modern humans make their way all the way around the southern coastline of India and Southeast Asia, all the way down to Australia and uh, New Guinea. They, uh, modern, modern humans appear in the fossil record there very quickly. It's, it's, it's quite likely that people just sort of hopscotched along the coast Although this might have been a very slow process. I mean, people might have just moved a few miles with each generation. But still, over a course of many generations, you can do that. And then people move uh, from Southeast Asia up into the northern part of Asia, sort of, uh, or rather, Eastern Asia there. Uh, again, modern humans were moving into Europe about 400,000 years ago. I guess I do have a clicker here, a laser pointer. This movement right here, um, you see uh, modern humans in sort of Central Asia 30 to 40,000 years ago. And then sometime bef before probably 15,000 years ago, you have uh, humans moving over this, this area, which was dry at that point, uh, the, sort of the Bering Land Bridge, but it was just a big old plain, no, no different than the plains uh, around here. And then they move up and down the length of North and South America uh, very quickly. And, uh, and sort of fill in those areas. There's lots of controversy about little detailed, little details of this, this overall map. But you know, this picture is held up pretty well uh, of how it goes. So as uh, modern humans were moving out into the rest of both Africa and Asia, they encountered lots of other groups of humans. There were, uh, there were archaic groups of humans living all over uh, the old world. Uh, there were Neanderthals in both Europe and Asia. Uh, and an even earlier form of human, Homo erectus, that sort of lived in, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, and there were various kinds of archaic humans in, in Africa. You know, when I wrote this book, um, we, didn't, we didn't really quite have all of the genetic evidence that we have today. And at that point, there wasn't very good evidence for modern humans breeding with any of the archaic humans they encountered as they were moving out into the rest of the world. Some of that, I, I sort of left the door open for the possibility of, of breeding when I wrote this book. I think I wrote that, uh, you know, human males will mate with almost anything. So it's a little hard to believe that as modern humans moved out of Africa, they wouldn't have mated with whatever they would have encountered there. And in fact, some evidence has appeared since this book came out, uh, demonstrating that there probably was some limited mixing of humans with Neanderthals and other groups. You can get genetic tests these days and see if you're two or three percent Neanderthal or something like that. I don't put a whole bunch of credence in those numbers, but, uh, but it does appear as if there's some decent evidence for that. Um, so anyway, if we're all descended from this relatively small group of people that moved out of Africa 150,000 years ago, why do we have such different appearances? Well, again, biologically, that's, uh, 
th that answer is, is relatively straightforward. As you, you know, the people who came out of Eastern Africa undoubtedly had dark skins. There's lots of advantage to having very dark skin in places with uh, high solar insulation. It protects you against uh, the, 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 sun, the effects of the sun, not only skin cancer, but other effects that you have in very sunny places. But as you move up into Europe, and uh, you, your dark skin can actually be a disadvantage because it blocks too much of the sun's rays. And there are various, various reasons why you sort of need sun in these far northern climates like the climate that we're in right now. Some, you know, and so what happens, I should say, when, when, uh, if you don't get enough vitamin D is you get rickets, like this boy has a genetic deficiency that causes rickets. And rickets does appear to have, uh, have appeared in humans as they were moving up into more northern climates. But say a woman had a mutation, or a man had a mutation that made their offspring uh, have lighter skin. Well, uh, those offspring would have done better in northern climates because they would have been able to absorb more sunlight in their skin. And, uh, and so more of those offspring would have survived. So that's, that's evolution at work, right? I mean, that's, that's what Charles Darwin, how Charles Darwin demonstrated to us that, that evolution does work. And so skin color uh, is, a, is a relatively easy change, thing to change as people move into different environments because um, it's just under the control of a few genes and it's, it's not so complicated to, uh, to get those to, to change. So, you know, this leads to lots of speculation about whether there might have been evolutionary pressures for various kinds of traits in human groups that could develop in the relatively recent time since humans moved out of Africa. It's, it's really, in evolutionary terms, that's just the blink of an eye. You know, the way I, the way I think about it is that skin color is a, a pretty easy thing to change, uh, but more complicated traits, you know, aggression or uh, intelligence, athleticism, I mean, those, those are the things, those, those traits are the product of really hundreds and thousands of genes working together with all the environmental influences that people have while they grow up. You know, you talk to a lot of biologists, uh, evolutionary biologists, and they'll just say, well, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that there would be great differences in human groups given the recency of our common ancestry and the fact that uh, that all of these human groups were similar to, were subject to similar environmental challenges except those of, you know, solar insulation and things like that. So it, it's certainly one thing that I concluded after reading this book is that, is, um, and, and I got to travel all over the world and, and meet with people for this book and, and uh, wow, the, you know, there was a Chinese geneticist that I met uh, in, in Shanghai when he was there and, and what he said is, if you look at the human species as a whole, I don't think it's correct to talk about races. People are just so damn similar. And um, that's, that's pretty much the conclusion that I came to when, when looking at the end of this book, that um, our genetic history is such that, that human beings really are very, I mean, we, we can divide ourselves culturally in all manner of ways, but biologically, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about profound biological differences between human groups. So that was my conclusion about you know working from the genes. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna talk about now I'm gonna go talk about genealogies. And this is gonna be t one, Tyler mentions you know odd ideas. And this is um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you about some odd ideas. And they sort of lead you to the same conclusion that some of the gen recent genetics research would lead you to, but but in a different direction. So if we're gonna talk about genealogies, we have to talk about uh, uh, family trees. So Here's, here's my family tree right here. This is this going back 10 generations on my family tree. So there I am. You, you probably know how to read you know, these diagrams. The squares are males and the, the circles are females. Here's me, here's my dad, my mom. My mom lives in Geek Harbor now. My dad's no longer alive. These are, these are all of my uh, male ancestors going all the way back to uh, what, that's Eric Hendrickson up there. Um, I, had, I had a member of my family who did all this work. I didn't do it. If, if you're interested in genealogy, the advice I always get, give to people is get somebody else in your family interested in it because, wow, it's so much work. And you know, if they do it, then it all applies to you as well. <laughs> Which is actually a little bit complicated when it comes to genetic tests and things like that. But um, uh, So, you know, that, now, now, I learned some very interesting things about this family tree that I'll, that I'll point out in a second. Some of them have to do with me, but some of them are generic. I mean, all of you have a family tree that looks just exactly like this. The names are just a little bit different. So one interesting thing about a family tree is that 
you know, in the relatively recent past, we don't have that many ancestors, right? I have two parents, four grandparents, eight grandparents, and so on. But if you go back just 10 generations to the year 1700, there's 1,024 people up here on this family tree. And these are my direct descendants. They're not, they're not brothers and sisters of my direct descendants. These, they're not what, what genealogists call collateral relatives. These are actual people who could have given me DNA. In fact, my Y chromosome, I know, comes from this gentleman. I know that because a company once gave me a genetic test and it turned out it really was him. Oftentimes there are oops moments that occur in male genealogies that, uh, so that Y chromosomes don't get passed down. But in my case, it really was this gentleman right here. Um, one interesting thing about genealogies is you know that they tend to run dry on the female side. Uh, it's, genealogists have a tendency to trace males a little bit more than females. You know, partly that's because of last name complications. But genealogies tend to run dry in general. I mean, people have done a huge amount of work on my family, oddly enough. You know, we have Utah connections and, and old East Coast connections and things. And from that huge amount of work, I can name maybe, I can name this guy, Eric Henriksen, I can name maybe 10 or 11 people uh, where, sort of up here. But wow, I have no idea who the rest of those people are. And nobody else does, really. I mean, the huge number of ancestors you have uh, just really defies being able to figure out who all these people are. Now, there's one interesting thing, about, another interesting thing about this tree is that, um, you know, each of these people up here, each of these 1,024 people, well, they had a family tree that looks just like this too, right? So 300 years before that, they had 1,024 ancestors. So at that point, if you did my whole family tree, I'd have a million ancestors up here in the year 1400. And if you did, and then if you extend the family tree back beyond that, I have a bill, more than a billion people on my family tree, as do all of you, in about the year 1100. So there's a problem with that number because uh, 11 billion people didn't live on the world in the year, in the year 1100. Um, so what happens, it turns out, and, and I'll, I'll explain in a little bit exactly how we came to this conclusion, and is that as you go back in time, in the very recent past, you don't have very many ancestors, but there, there's, a, there's a transition point that occurs about six or 700 years ago. And at that point, your ancestors in a population expands exponentially to become everybody in that population who has descendants living today. That's just the way that it works. So if you have a Irish grandmother as I do, in about the year 1400, everybody in Ireland who has, um, who has descendants living today is on my family tree. Now that's, that's a very bizarre thing, but it's just mathematically certain that that's the way that it works. And here's, so here's a little population with 16 people. So say this is the present here, this is the past. These are individuals right here going back each generation. So if that's you, here's your parents, here's your grandparents, here are your eight grand grandparents. And you see very quickly in this graph, it just expands to fill up everybody. Well, this happens in much larger populations as well. So that, um, <clears throat> so that your, your ancestry saturates in the part of the world that you're from. And this happens on each, each, uh, each side of your ancestry. So here's another way of looking at this. Um, again, here's the present, and here's the past going back here. And this, is, this sort of includes everybody in a population going back through time. So here you are in the present, and in the very recent past, you have relatively few members of that population who are your ancestors. But you reach this point, and, and again, for most people, this is 600 to 700 years ago, where this number just all of a sudden explodes, and it becomes, very quickly becomes everybody in the population is an ancestor of yours, is the way that this works. <clears throat> so, you know, that's, that's for the parts of the world where you're from. So my, my ancestors are English, Irish, German, and uh, I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be remembering the other one. German, English, Irish. Well, there's a fourth one in there. All Europeans, I'm a very white bread type of guy. Um, so, so the implication clearly, and, and I've written many articles about this, is that I'm descended from everybody in Europe who, as, as are most of the people in this room, you're descended from everybody in Europe who has ancestors living today who lived in about the year 1400 or 1300. You know, including kings. We're all, we're all descended from Charlemagne, and we're all descended from the early kings and queens of, of England. You can't prove it, 
But mathematically, it's a it's demonstrable fact that this is, this is the way that ancestry works. So what does that say about um, my being descended from people in other parts of the world um, other, than, other than Europe? Well, here's a little diagram that shows how this works in genealogical terms. So people always used to think that human beings didn't move around much. I think that that's been pretty thoroughly debunked at this point, though people move around a lot more today than they ever have in the past. Uh, people have always throughout human history moved around for various reasons. They've been, they've been slaves or they've been soldiers or they've been traders. I mean, if you look at the historical record, it's really impossible to find a population that was both completely isolated and never sent one member of a population to any other member. So say if you start looking back in your past, and here's a European, and this, this European just happens to have come to Europe from, let's say this is Africa. Let's say this is Africa over here, and this is Europe over here. So this person right here is what genealogists call a gateway ancestor. It's, a, it's an ancestor that takes you into a whole different part of the world or society. It's, it's, it's great fun for genealogists, of course, because then if this person is somebody famous, all of a sudden you're descended from all that person's famous ancestors. So the way that migration works genealogically is that these, as people migrate and move around the world, it sort of ties together these webs of ancestry. And, you know, this happens with every single branch of my family tree, by the way. Um, I'm sure, uh, well, my, the other part of my family tree, of course, is Norwegian, because I demonstrated that I have those Norwegian grandfathers that go all the way back. But I know for a fact that that grandfather, 10 generations ago, migrated to Norway from Finland. So Finland, they didn't even used to consider the Finns Caucasians, they considered them Asians because of the great amount of migration that uh, occurred across Northern Asia, really throughout history. So it's almost certain that if 10 generations ago I had a Finnish ancestor, that 20 generations ago I had an ancestor from Northern Asia. Well, there's always been a lot of migration between Northern Asia and China. So if you go back 30 generations, I certainly had an ancestor who lived in China. So that, even though you know, there are no paper records that demonstrate that fact, you can just demonstrate mathematically that I have, that I have, would have had ancestors from China just in the year, of, you know, probably that, that would be 900 or 1100, somewhere right around in there. So these networks of ancestry, they spread out into the rest of the world, and that's the case for all of my ancestors, and really, if you think about it, for all of yours. I mean, my German grandmother must have been descended from, uh, from European, uh, from Asian traders, rather, in the Middle Ages that came to the great trade fairs in Europe, and my Irish ancestor would have had Spanish ancestors from people that washed up after the Spanish Armada crashed on the coast. And, and you know, huge numbers of African Americans moved into, um, into England in the 14th and 15th century. There's really not an African American population in England as such anymore. They just married into the population and, and sort of gradually became absorbed. So that's how, that's how ancestries get extended into other parts of the world. So that leads you to be able to sort of uh, ask an interesting question. Um, if, I, if I take myself and any other person in this room and I say, okay, where is the first person that we have who's on both of our family trees? In other words, where is our common ancestor going back in time? Well, because our ancestries get so large, you can always find that person. And just looking out in this room, I'd say most of us are probably 10th or 11th cousins, maybe 8th cousins. We're certainly no more than 14th cousins. And that's how many generations you have to go back to find a common ancestor between one person and another person, especially people with a lot of European heritage. Because very quickly, you know, we don't have these perfect records, but if we had perfect records of exactly who got married to whom and who had children with whom, we'd be able to find that common ancestor. So you can do the same thing with three people. You can say, okay, let's take three people in this room and let's find the common ancestor of all three of us. And again, mathematically, you can be guaranteed that that person exists. Uh, there, is, there is a common ancestor. So one of, the, one of the questions I asked in this book is I said, well, there must be a common ancestor then of everybody living on the planet today. And who would that person be? And, and where would that person have been? I didn't answer that question in this book, but after the book came out, I was sort of challenged on that point because lots of people said, well, that common ancestor must have lived tens or tens of thousands of years ago. And I said, oh no, that common ancestor really probably just lived two or 3,000 years ago. It just has to have happened that it was more recent than that. So I, I, so I really got interested in this question and, and sort of teamed up with a couple of people to do the heavy scientific lifting. And, and we, we analyzed this problem to try to figure out uh, what is the most recent 
common ancestor of all living humans. And here's a kind of a complicated graph that shows the answer that we came up to. We actually looked at this question two different ways. We did a, a graph theory, a sort of mathematical graph theory to figure out, and then we, um, we also did this very elaborate computer model, which basically modeled uh, all human beings mating with each other over the course of the past 10 or 12,000 years. And they both came to the same answer. And we published this article in Nature, uh, the three of us, uh, not, not too terribly long after the book comes out. So this, this is the, the strange idea that I was gonna, gonna introduce to people. You won't believe it, but just let it sink in for a while and gradually it'll start to make more sense. This uh, on the x-axis here is time. So here's the present, and this is going back in time to the, here's the year 0 AD, 2000 BC, 4000, 6000, 8000 BC. And, what are, and, and on the y-axis, this says percentages of common ancestors. So this is the percentage of people in a population who are the ancestors of everyone living on the planet today, is the way that it works. Because when the first common ancestor appears right here in about the year 500 BC, this person, actually it probably would have been a couple, it would have been a man and a woman, they are the ancestors of everyone living on the planet today, right? So as it turns out, the way genealogies work is that very quickly, within just the, the, another thousand years before that, you move to this point where, in the year 1500 BC, everyone living on the planet is an ancestor of every single person living on the planet today. Actually, that's not quite true. I want to describe this a little more carefully. What happens is that um, the people living in the year 1500 BC can be divided into two groups. And one group is a group of people who don't have any ancestors living today. And they're people who didn't have children or their children didn't have children. In other words, their lineages died out. And that happens relatively quickly. If you have four or five grandchildren, it's almost sure that your lineage is not going to die out, that, it's, that your genes are gonna to continue to be represented in the human gene pool. So anyway, one group is the group of people whose lineages have died out. Well, everybody else on the planet is, a, is on everybody, is on the family tree of every single person living today. And we call this the universal, the universal ancestry point right here. Um, and it's a, it's a totally bizarre idea because what it means is that all of us in this room are descended not just from all the Europeans. I mean, this is, this is the, 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 the population of the entire world. So it means that we're descended not just from all the Europeans who uh, have descendants living today who lived in the year 1500 BC, but we're descended from all the Africans, all the Asians, all of the, uh, even, even, even Native Americans. I mean, Native Americans who lived back then, bizarrely enough, we are descended from them because of migration back over the Bering Land Bridge is the way that this works. Now, it, just because we're descended from those people does not mean that we get our genes in equal proportions from those people. So most of, my, most of the genes that I have right now are, were in Europeans in the year 1500 BC, but because I'm descended from everyone else, there's at least a possibility that parts of my genome could have come from those people. So my genome could have been widely scattered. In fact, you can use these models that we wrote about in, in Nature to sort of calculate how much of your genome you would expect to come from various parts of the world given very reasonable rates of migration that have occurred over time. And you know, the other really bizarre thing about this is that it works going forward too, right? So here's another little diagram which is actually showing the same thing. So here you are in the present, and let's say your lineage, and, and this shows that in the year 1500 BC, you're descended from everyone living in that year who has ancestors living today. Well, say you have children, and your children have children. In other words, that your lineage does not go extinct. For a while, for, for 10 or 12 generations, you're gonna have just a few descendants. But in about 2,000 years, you're gonna be a, an ancestor of everybody living on the planet. That's just, just the way it works. It's, uh, it, can, it can be guaranteed that it's gonna happen that way. So, you know, this, this is a very strange idea. I mean, it took me a long time to get used to it. it you know, like the genetic results, it sort of seems to indicate that the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and how we're related to other groups are not, not, a, not a reflection of the scientific reality, really. When you look at the genes or when you look at how genealogies actually work, we tell ourselves these stories for one reason, but 
but they don't have a lot, they don't have a lot to do with, um, with the science. So, you know, um, when I was when I was growing up in Othello, uh, I lived in this you know little small town and never got out of that town. We really, I mean, we didn't we didn't go anywhere when I was growing up. And wow, I thought the world was a huge, this just big and strange place that uh, that I was never going to under, understand very well being in a small town like that. You know, I remember going over to Seattle and and seeing the condominiums uh, on the hillsides there. We'd go over to watch Seattle SuperSonics games, of course and think, wow, if I could live in one of those condominiums, I, I really would have done everything that I ever wanted to do in this world. I would, well, oddly enough now, I do live in one of those condominiums. <laughs> so I, I guess that kind of worked out. Um, but really, the, the, the odd career I've had writing this book and the other kinds of things I've done, writing about genetics and evolution, um, I've really had a chance to travel all over the world. It just it, it shocks me, really, when I think about you know, the, the, the sort of cloistered surroundings that I, that I grew up in. And even though I thought the world was going to be a, a, a big and strange place, it turned out not to be quite as strange as I thought it would be. And, you know, partly it's because of the results of this science, that, that, that people are not all that different when you get out of a small town and, and start to experience them. Um, it really turns out that, that Othello was kind of a reflection of that world, and, and there was more of the world in Othello than I ever would have assumed at the time. I really didn't give it credit, and... Uh, and, and I should have. I wish it was a, a lesson that I'd learned a lot earlier. So that's it. Thanks very much for inviting me back here. It's been wonderful to come back and see what's happened.